Well, uh, there are a whole range of environmental injustices in India. And for simplicity, let me break them down into rural environmental problems and urban environmental problems. A large portion of the rural population in India depends on natural resources for livelihood. So access to forests, water, pasture is crucial for farming and pastoral and communities and also fisher folk. And uh, the questions of access and control. So for generations, rural communities have had control over water and pasture and forests. But when rapid economic growth takes place and you have the state diverting these resources to factories or mines, uh, this leads to deprivation and environmental injustice. A second form of environmental injustice in the countryside is when even if the resources are not physically taken away, uh, uh, you know, peasant communities suffer from uh, the pollution caused by factories and mines in their vicinity. So, you know, debris on their fields or fly ash from coal plants because India depends massively on thermal energy. These are, this also uh, is, is a major problem. In the cities, uh, which are growing, and India has now one in every three Indians live in cities. So India has about 350 million people living in cities. There, again, rich people are relatively insulated from pollution, though they do face air pollution. They have access to, uh, you know, they have high nutrition levels, they have access to good medical care. On the other hand, you have slum dwellers who don't have access to clean water, where around them sanitation is poor, which leads to the spread of disease, because uh, uh, the standards of nutrition are lower, uh, they are much more vulnerable to air pollution, they suffer much more from respiratory problems and so on. So, uh, both in the cities and in the countryside, there are manifold forms of environmental injustices being perpetrated every day. I think what is driving these injustices is uh, the, the desire to remove poverty and grow the economy very quickly. I mean, there's a kind of a competitive edge to Indian economic development, where we are competing not only with the West, but also with China. And rapid economic growth is seen as an overwhelming priority, regardless of short-term or medium-term environmental consequences. And I think that's the major reason for these problems. Well, uh, <coughs> there are a few public intellectuals active in addressing environmental injustices, both in English and in the Indian languages. But they are met by a vigorous op opposition from intellectuals who see environmental questions as a distraction from economic growth. You know, India is poor, it needs to develop, it needs to catch up with the West, it also needs to catch up with China. I mean, there's a long-standing rivalry, economic and political and military with China, which is our great Asian neighbor. And unfortunately, too many intellectuals think that uh, India must get rich first before cleaning up, cleaning, cleaning up afterwards. And the argument is made that India is too poor to be green, which I think is a mistaken one, because I think if we continue along this reckless path of unregulated development, we will imperil the prospects for our future generations. So there is a very active debate in the public sphere between intellectuals who are sympathetic to environmental justice and on the other side, like intellectuals who see this, these questions as uh, unnecessary distractions from what they see as the preeminent objective, which is rapid economic growth. Well, I think the difficulties are manifold. One is in an age of social media, it's not easy to get people together. You know, the, the social media, the internet tends to make individuate society. 25 years ago, uh, if there was a massive leak in uh, and a, a massive pollution of the Shalitsia River, you could have got 10,000 people protesting on the streets. Now you may get... 500 people clicking on change.org, but you know, that doesn't that's have the same impact. That's one kind of uh, problem. A second kind of problem is the apathy, apathy of the political system. You know, politicians who work here on, on a five-year cycle of elections aren't really interested in addressing questions that take 10 or 15 or 20 years to resolve. A third kind of constraint is uh, just massive pollution, pollution uh, massive, massive corruption and inefficiency in the state system. Uh, a fourth kind of constraint would be the apathy of the media, which doesn't really actively report environmental questions. So it's an uphill battle, but at the same time, India is a democracy. There are spaces open for protest and dissent that would not be open, shall we say, in China or other countries. So there is an active environmental movement, but it is always a difficult and sometimes lonely, lonely and uphill battle.
Well, a just future would, for me, would look uh, would be one which combines um, uh, economic security with environmental stability. So I think there are parts of India where the poverty is endemic and must be removed by rapid economic growth. I think there are many Indians who are consuming too much. At the same time, there are elite Indians who may be consuming. To, there are many Indians who are consuming too little, and there may be a significant minority of Indians who are consuming too much. So clearly, we have to forge a path of economic development that is equitable, sustainable, meets uh, uh, what are basic human requirements of safe housing, education, health, transportation, uh, the freedom to choose your place of work. Uh, it's a long, long and arduous, uh, you know, road to get to it. And uh, at the moment, uh, you know, the, the hurdles are immense. But for me, a just future be, would be one which combines economic security with environmental stability.